For scripture reading, uh, please open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 9 and we'll be reading from verses 1 to 7. Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 to 7. I'll be reading a New King James uh, Version Bible. If you have, a, a, have an apps or other um, versions, you can uh, read it with me. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he likely esteemed the land of Zebulun in the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil, for you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments brewed in blood will be used for burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government in peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment, Injustice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. May the Lord bless the reading of this passage. Clear Booth said, There is no hopeless situation. There are only people who have grown hopeless about them. You know, several years ago, Researchers experimented to see the effect of hope has on those undergoing hardship. Two sets of laboratory rats were placed in separate tubs of water. The researcher left one set in the water and found out that within an hour, they had all drowned. And die. The other rats were periodically lifted out of the water and then returned. What when that happened? The second set of rats swung for over 24 hours. Why? Not because they were given a rest, because they just been lifted and put back right away, but because the rats suddenly had hope. Those animals somehow hope that if they could stay afloat just a little longer, someone would reach down and rescue them. If hope, if hope holds such a powerful, you know, power for unthinking rats, how much greater would its effect in our lives today? Hope is a powerful force. And as we begin the season of Advent, the preparation to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, we will study about our blessed hope as Christian, as a child of God. You know, our world today, look around you, open the news. Our world is unsettled. Our world is despairing. Many people are living hopeless lives nowadays. War, natural disasters, and worldwide inflation causing severe economic condition for many people nowadays. Here in Canada, the soaring rental costs and high mortgage interest cause many Canadians 
even to depend on food banks to supplement their income. Even right now, there are present survey that even two couple are working. It's not enough because of the high cost of living in high cost of rental. All of these factors undermine people's self-confidence. Alcohol, drug abuse is on the rise. Domestic violence, marriage breakdown, emotional disturbance, and even suicides are increasing. And the level of violence in our community here in Toronto is growing. Every week there are shooting, there are stabbing in our city. And people are asking, is there hope for a better world? Is there any hope for a better future? Maybe some parents who have small kids, children are asking that. Is there any hope for a better world, better future for my little ones? The answer is yes. There is hope. Because we live in the age of fulfillment. We live in the age of hope. The Bible teaches that Christians have a blessed hope. We have a blessed hope that someday our world will experience absolute peace. Someday there are no more wars and no more death. We have a blessed hope that someday there will be no more hunger, no more sickness, no more broken marriages and suffering in this world. And Christmas reminds us of the birth of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the blessed hope of the world. In the scripture passages that we read a while ago, we see that during the prophet Isaiah's time, the people of Israel also lost their hope. They also live in a despairing period of their nation history. Assyria, which is a modern Iraq right now, or Iraqis, had already threatened Judah. Israel, the northern kingdom, was conquered and crushed by the Assyrians. Yet the prophet Isaiah had a vision of hope. He prophesied in Isaiah chapter 9, 1 to 7, the coming of the Messiah, the blessed hope of our ailing world. Christians throughout the ages have read these particular passages as the source of their hope. So what is our blessed hope? As we come into the Christmas season, what does God's word assure us of? I want to begin by looking at verse 6 as we discover our blessed hope this coming Christmas season. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, that a child would be born whose name would be wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. The child described here is Jesus Christ, the hope of every man, the hope of every woman in child living today. And so, if we come to a better understanding of who He is, we will have a better understanding of the hope that we have in Him. As we begin the season of Advent, preparing to celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, we will reflect together on the source of our hope. Let us begin our message by first considering our hope rest in the wonderful Counselor. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. The scriptures state that Jesus is a wonderful counselor. And no doubt, Jesus has the answer to every question. He has the solution to every problem. The name Counselor speaks of Jesus' wisdom. 
However, you know, wisdom is considered worthless when it is not available or when it cannot be applied in our life. Jesus as our counselor become available to us when he was born in a manger 2,000 years ago. The shepherds announced his birth and wise men went to worship him. When Jesus was born, the counselor became available to mankind. Jesus was always available to people around him during his ministry. He was available to both children and adults. He was available to both rich and poor. He was available today for you and for me. As a wonderful counselor, Jesus came with the answer to all of man's questions. If you are weary in mind, Jesus says, Come unto me, all you are weary and heavy burden, and I'll give you rest. If you are in need, if you need basic worldly goods, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things you need will be provided to you as well. If you are worried about life, Jesus says, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. I will always be with you. I will never abandon you nor forsake you. If you want to be a witness to the lost, to your unsaved family members whom you love, Jesus said, you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. If you are awake in body, Jesus says, rise up, take up your bed and walk. As he said to the paralytic man who cannot even stand. Remember when Jesus was a boy, recorded in the book of Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. Jesus gave answers to teachers in the temple, to the Pharisees and Sadducees. And his understanding was so deep that the teachers of the law were all amazed. Jesus answered Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jew, in John chapter 3, when he asked, How can one enter the kingdom of heaven? And like Nicodemus, probably some of you here would like also to know the way to heaven. And Jesus answered Nicodemus' inquiry, and he will for sure answer you if you sincerely want to know the way to heaven. As wonderful counselor, Jesus came with assurance for hopeless sinners. He brought a message of love. Jesus showed his love. For example, to the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4 who was living in adultery. She had many husbands, yet when she repented, Jesus saved her. Jesus showed his love for Zacchaeus, the crooked tax collector in Luke chapter 19. Jesus showed his love for a dying repentant thief at the cross of Calvary and promised to bring him to paradise that day. Jesus brought hope to those who have no hope. Are you facing problems? Right now, problems in your marriage, problems in your work, relational, relational problems within your family, problems with your children. Do you lose hope? And want to give up that your problem is so great. It seems there's no solution. Remember, no problem is too difficult for the Lord Jesus Christ, our wonderful counselor to solve. He still reaches out today to those who have no hope. Come to Him, and He will help you. He offers hope to you and me. And as we celebrate Christmas, we need to remember that He is our wonderful counselor. 
His answers are really man to every need of every age. Bring your burdens. Bring your problems to Him. He has counsel for every crisis. He has plan for every problem. A direction for every dilemma. A prescription for every pain. And a message for every man. To the Christian, the Lord's counsel is like honey to the taste. Harmony to the ear. Help to the poor, to the body. Happiness to the soul. And hope to the heart. Indeed, our hope rests in a wonderful counselor. Secondly, our blessed hope is rest in the mighty God. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. You know, the prophet Isaiah prepared us for Christmas. He prophesied in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. It says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with a child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God is with us. The title of the newborn son explains why he is such a wonderful counselor. It is because he is the Almighty God. Only God, by the way, is all knowing. Only God could possess all knowledge and wisdom. The mighty God is also omnipotent. He is all powerful. He is the supreme ruler. In the prophet Isaiah prophesied that this child to be born of the Spirit of God is the mighty God. How much the prophet Isaiah understood? We have no way of knowing. Yet it is clear that the ancient prophet could see this child as being the mighty one of God. By the way, Jesus is the only God-man. He is very unique. No other person is like Him. Because He is 100% God and 100% man at the same time. He is fully God and fully man at the same time. Mary knew when Jesus was born that He was older than her. But the same age as Jesus, Heavenly Father. Before time began, Jesus Christ existed with His Heavenly Father. Jesus came down the starry sky of glory. He was born in Bethlehem, hidden in Egypt, raised in Nazareth, baptized in the river Jordan, and tented on the wilderness. Christ performed miracles on the roadside, healed multitudes without medicine, raised the dead to life like Lazarus. He walked on the waters and cast out demons during his ministry. Jesus Christ conquered everything that came up against him. Then Jesus Christ took all our sins up to Calvary and died for the world. Jesus was buried in Joseph's new tomb and on schedule rose out of the grave on the third day with the power of His omnipotence. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords and His kingdom will last forever. No earthly king could ever be thought to be invincible. No earthly king could have a kingdom that has no end. But Jesus' kingdom will be everlasting. This coming king prophesied by the prophet Isaiah will be the son of King David. 
He would accomplish what the other king could not do. He would capture the hearts of humankind by the thousands and win their loyalty and their love. He would have a kingdom based on unusual power. Today, on the side of Bethlehem, we can really see how powerful Jesus is. Yet His might is not found in army. His might is not found in the machines of war. But the overwhelming love He has from humankind. No other force on earth is more powerful than God's love. Today, you know, social scientists can put a new suit on men, but only Jesus Christ can put a new man in a suit. Jesus precedes all others in their priority, exceeds all others in their superiority, and succeeds all others in their finality. Indeed, our hope rests in a wonderful counselor, a mighty God. Thirdly, our hope rests in the everlasting Father. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. I believe that the prophet Isaiah celebrated Christmas in the Old Testament about 2,700 years ago. By faith, he saw Jesus Christ, a king unlike any other earthly king. He saw the Son who was the gift of God the Father. This child is a son of King David. He saw the coming of Jesus Christ in advance. From the virgin birth to the coming millennial kingdom in the future. The Bible clearly states that there will be no end to Jesus' kingdom. Jesus is called an everlasting father. And as an everlasting father, Jesus existed before his birth. I find it very difficult to understand how other religions could miss this prophecy of Isaiah concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Those religions that believe that Jesus is just a man, you know, and not God miss entirely the meaning of this prophecy. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. He who sees me sees my Father. Isaiah called Jesus Christ the everlasting Father in this particular verse. What does the everlasting Father imply? God the everlasting one entered time when he was born in Bethlehem as required by the prophecy of Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Now let me read to you Micah chapter 5 verse 2. It says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. The everlasting one made himself subject to time by becoming a man. The miracles of the incarnations are explained by the Apostle Paul. When he wrote Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. Have this attitude in yourselves, which also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We see Jesus 
pre-incarnate position. In verse 6, it says, Jesus existed in the form of God before His birth. Jesus existed and lived in heaven with God the Father before the creation of the world. We find Him into Himself being made in the likeness of man. That's what we call incarnation. Jesus, who is God, become a man. Why? In verse 8, Jesus said, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and died on the cross. The reason why he was born in this earth in order for him to die on the cross, in order for him to pay for the penalty of our sin, to be our Savior. In all of this, Jesus, the everlasting Father, subject himself to time. He was born at a particular time. And we call that time today Christmas. A time when the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ, was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. Jesus is the reason for the season. He is the reason for all the celebration this month of December. It is Jesus' birthday. We are celebrating on Christmas Eve. Not Santa Claus. Forget about the Santa Claus parade. That's why. He is, the, he is not the main character of, of Christmas. He is just an invention. We are celebrating Jesus' birthday. Not Santa Claus, not Mr. Scrooge, not Rudolph the Red Nose Winter. We are celebrating the coming of the Messiah into this world. The fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah prophesied. Jesus Christ, the everlasting Father, had experienced growth over time. And in birth and death, He was on time. However, now Jesus is alive forevermore. By subjecting Himself to time, Jesus now offered eter eternal life to us who were subject to time. As members of the human race, we are subject to time. From the time of our birth. Then, after birth, we begin to grow, right? Time takes its toll on all of us. As we grow older, our skin starts to wrinkle, our body experiences some weakness, and we suffer from a lot of pain and sickness. Sooner, we will all live this life. We will all die. But by faith in Christ, we receive a blessed hope of everlasting life someday. What will you do with God's offer of everlasting life? Receive it by faith while you have time. Jesus is your only hope to live an everlasting life someday. But for us who have received Jesus' free gift of salvation, good news, we will not be subject to time anymore in the future. We will become like Jesus Christ. We will be clothed with His glorified body and we will live with Him forever and ever for eternity in heaven, which is our final hope. Oh, what a blessed hope for us who believe in the everlasting Father that someday when our life is over in this world, He will give us eternal life. Indeed, our blessed hope rests in a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and lastly, our hope rests in the Prince of Peace, we are told that not only do we have the hope of a wonderful counselor, mighty God, 
everlasting Father, we have the hope of the Prince of Peace. Isaiah calls Jesus the Prince of Peace and describes his domain in the following verse, Isaiah 9 verse 7. This passage is prophetic because it will not be fully actualized until the millennial kingdom in the future. During the millennial reign of Christ, after his second coming, our Savior Jesus Christ will rule and reign over all the earth. The establishment of the domain will rest upon the Lord's shoulder. The extent of this kingdom is summed up in the word of Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7 there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace the expansion of this millennial empire of Jesus Christ will materialize when Jesus is on the throne in judgment in justice in the land it is going to be a different when Jesus comes back again at his second coming. And by the way, if you look around us, we will see the sign of Jesus' second coming very evident in our world today. And I honestly believe that any time now, the rapture will happen. Any time now, Jesus will come. And the end of the world will come. Because if you study the scripture, all the prerequisite, all the signs of Jesus coming is happening in our world nowadays. And when Jesus comes back at his second coming, when he establishes his millennial kingdom, he will become our king of kings and lord of lords. Isaiah described the state of the government under Jesus Christ, the prince of peace, in verse 5. He says that the warrior sandals in his garments with the blood of the battle on them will be fuel for fire. So all these arms, all this uniform for battle will be used as fuel. Because no more war when Jesus comes again. There's no more strife. Revelation chapter 21 verse 3 describe the peace that we have ahead of us. It says the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Oh, what a blessed hope we have in the future as a child of God that we will experience someday absolute peace absolute joy and we will be able to see and talk to God face to face. Are you longing to see Jesus' face at all? You know the caricature, those painting about Jesus, is nothing. <laughs> there is no record that describes Jesus Christ. Right? Are you longing to see the face of your Savior Jesus Christ face to face? Are you longing to talk to him in person? Yes, we will be able to see him face to face, not only to see him face to face someday, but we will be able to talk with him. Oh, how I long to see the face of my Savior Jesus Christ, to see the marks of the nails in his hands and feet. As Christian, we live with a blessed bright future someday we're going to leave this world full of sorrow full of pain and be with our god in heaven throughout eternity and god will wipe away every tear from our eyes and there shall be no more death no more sorrow no more crying there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. That's what it means to have the Prince of Peace as your hope. Jesus Christ is the child 
that the prophet Isaiah wrote, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And yet, many have refused to embrace the hope that resides in Him. But this afternoon, have you accepted Him and embraced this hope? Jesus is the hope of the world. He is your only hope. Now in closing, certainly Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah prophecy in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 8. Because no ordinary descendant of King David could qualify. Jesus Christ left heaven and became the God-man who embodied all the qualities mentioned here in our passage. He, and He alone, is the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, in the, the Prince of Peace. But some people did not believe in Jesus. When He first came as a baby in Bethlehem, He did not meet their standards. Although He met the scriptural standards. He met the criteria that is being prophesied regarding the coming Messiah. Jesus was not the kind of king most of the Jewish people wanted when he first came. Thus they rejected him as their Messiah. And people are still rejecting Jesus Christ today. What will you do? Will you reject the blessed hope of the world? Or you will accept Him as the long hope Messiah who will someday bring peace, true peace in this world. May the Lord bless His message to us.